Okay, guys, let's lift our voices and worship our God. Fail me. 
Hey guys, we are so excited that you are joining us for another one of our online weekend worship experiences. My name is Matthew, and if I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm one of the pastors here at Rise Church, and I have some things that I feel God has put on my heart, and I'm, I'm just hoping and praying that, that they will bless you as much as they have blessed me. So before we dive into God's Word together, Um, I just want to open us up in a word of prayer, and then we will just get this thing rolling. God, thank you so much, God, for who you are. God, I I pray that as we spend this time together today in your word, Lord, that you would just open our eyes to what you have for us today. God, I pray that you would remove me, God, and that these would not be my words, but that they they would be your words. God, that, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would just fill us with the Holy Spirit and that you would reveal things to us that maybe maybe we, you never have before. God, I, I pray a, a blessing over each and every person who is with us this weekend, God, that you would just meet them right where they are. God, that you would remove any distractions. God, maybe any frustrations that are going on in life right now that would pull them away from the truth of your word. God, that you would just give us ears to hear. God, eyes to see who it is that you are. God, and how much you love us and care for us. We love you, God. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Again, if you're joining us this weekend, we are just so excited that you allowed us to come into your your home or wherever it is that you might be watching this from. And I'm excited to share some things with you that God has put on my heart. If you were with us last week, um, I I was sharing with you how at the beginning of this year, God kind of put something on my wife and and I's heart of of wanting to kind of dive into God's Word. And 
And I know what many of you are probably thinking, and maybe you're thinking now if you weren't with us last week, like, you know, God wanted us to kind of dive into the Word of God with a group of people, and you're probably thinking, well, you're a pastor. Of course you want to get into God's Word. But, but as I shared last weekend, um, what God was showing me is that I was, in fact, spending time in God's Word um, but typically it was geared around wanting to prepare a message or a sermon or, or some teaching time that I was, I was prepping for. And what God was revealing to me was that, that I, I was gaining a lot of head knowledge. And, and what God was wanting was to reveal himself in an intimate way to me and to, to reveal himself through his word to me. And so we started just reading God's word and we're not dissecting it, we're just going through it reading it and trusting that God's going to show us more of who he is. And he's been doing that along the way. And we've been reading through a lot of stories that many of us are familiar with, like Noah and Moses and, and Abraham. And, and we've gotten through King David that we're going to talk about a little bit today. But many of us are familiar with these stories. And it's been amazing to read them in a different context, not to try to break, break it down verse by verse, but to just look at it. And trust that God's going to reveal it to me. So shameless plug, if, if you are not doing that, I would so, so encourage you to, to get a group of people together and just journey through God's Word. We use the Read Scripture app, and I would encourage you to use the same one. Or there's version, like I talked about last week. So many different great methods of doing that. But, but this idea that there are so many times in our life when I think you and I can become deceived and we can kind of be led astray if we are not rooted in God's Word and not fundamentally spending time with God each and every day. There are so many times where we can become deceived, where we can be led astray and have a warped view of, of God and a warped view of, of ourselves and, and I think how God sees us. But it was interesting as, as we've been kind of journeying through about a month ago, three or four weeks ago, we we uh, got through the book of 2 Samuel, and it's all about David's life. First and Second Samuel, it's, it's one of the main themes of, of the story that you'll find in those two books is King David, that many of us know the story of David and Goliath, and that's what we think of when we hear the name David. But I was struck with the life of David. I, I was enamored with the life of David. Um, in particularly, I, I was... I was enamored with David's sin. You see, so many times I think when you and I uh, read these stories, whether it's when we're growing up in church and Sunday school or even as adults or teenagers, we can almost elevate these individuals that we read in the Bible, David, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Paul, Peter, these amazing men of God, we can elevate them to almost an unhealthy place where, where we think, man, like I could never be used by God like that. I could never never be used by God in those ways. And these are such amazing men of God that I, I, could, never, I could never get to their level, right? And, and that's the mindset that oftentimes you and I can have as we're reading and hearing stories about them. But, but what we need to understand, and I think what God has been revealing to me is that these were just men. Like understand, many of you have probably heard this saying, but, but God does not call the equipped he equips the call. And so there isn't this, this thing where it's like, man, I, I, I've done too much bad in life for God to ever use me. And yet oftentimes, that's kind of the mindset. And so what, what I was captured by as we were kind of studying the life of David was that David was a very broken man. David was a man who had some very real struggles and sins, and desires that he had in his heart, and in his life, and in his flesh that were not from God. And as we were journeying through it, I was just blown away by David's sin. And in 2 Samuel, um, starting in chapter 11, we're not going to read it, but I just want to share a little bit with you, because I began to just kind of meditate on, on this story of David and his sin, and his almost what I would say one of his biggest mistakes in life. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we, we see this story of King David, and, and what happens is he sees this woman bathing on her roof. And he, he turns to his servant and he said, who, who is that? Who is that? She's up there bathing. I mean, you can imagine she's probably not bathing fully 
clothed. Like, and he turns to his servant. Instead of turning the other way and going the other way, he, he, he looks and he says, who, who is that? And his servant responds and he says, that's, that's Uriah's wife. And so at this point, I think David is already at a crossroads, right? Where the best thing for him to do is just turn around and go back inside. But, but as you read the story, you see that David doesn't do that. That he turns back to a servant and he says, go get her for me. And it's crazy as you read the story because I think like about today, like in the world that we live in, like imagine if somebody in a position of authority did this today. Like if they saw a married woman and, and, and she, they were attracted to her and he, and he said to, you know, maybe his secretary or his assistant or whatever the case may be, hey, go get her for me. Like can you imagine if we heard about something happening like that in today's world, like how disgusted we would be. Like if somebody did that today, like we would be so just appalled but this, the story goes on and, and David's servant goes and gets this woman and brings her into his home and David sleeps with her knowing she's married. Not just married, but married to a man named Uriah, as I shared, who is actually, if you study scripture, you come to find that Uriah was actually one of David's best friends. So it's not just some random, you know, woman and, 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 and her husband that David didn't know, but it's actually one of his best friends. And so he sleeps with this woman and she gets pregnant. She goes home and she sends a word back to David and she says, I'm pregnant. And so at this point, like, as I'm reading the story, I'm thinking, man, if I'm David, like, I'm like, what did I do? Like, what in the world did I do? And yet you read the story and you see that's not at all what David does. What David does is he, he instantly goes into this panic mode of like, I have to cover this up. Like, I got to figure out a way to get out of this situation that I got myself into. And so what he does is he sends word to the army and he says, I need you guys to send Uriah home. And so Uriah comes home and David is asking him, you know, how's it going out there? And, and they're kind of catching up a little bit that way. And then David says, hey, be, before you go back out to battle, why don't you go home and, and spend some time with your wife? You know, spend the night with your wife. Because in David's mind, he's thinking, man, if I can get Uriah to stay the night with his wife, then, you know, he, he's going to probably sleep with her because he's been away at battle and they probably miss each other. And so they're going to spend that time together as, as husband and wife. And then he'll go, He'll go back out to battle, but if he does that, then maybe we can just convince everybody that he's the one who got her pregnant, and I'm never going to have to face this. And so I'm reading this story, and I'm like, dude, what in the world is wrong with you? And it gets even worse because Uriah is such this man of character that when he gets there and he's talking to David, and David's like, go home and spend the night with your wife, Uriah's like, dude, I can't go home, like, all of my friends, like all of the people that I oversee are out there fighting in a war right now. And I could not go home and spend the night with my wife knowing that I'm supposed to be out there fighting with them side by side. So we see Uriah as this man of complete integrity. And if I were David, I would just be so incredibly disgusted with myself at this point. So David, or Uriah, excuse me, doesn't go home, but he says... I'll sleep on your, on your, right outside your door of, of your house. Like, I'm not going to go home to my wife, and then tomorrow morning I'm going right back out there to fight in this war. And so that's exactly what happens. And at this point, like, you see David, you can almost see his brain, like, just freaking out at this point, and he's thinking, now what am I going to do? Like, plan one, you know, was to have him come home and sleep with his wife, and that way I could get out of it, and that didn't work, so... I guess I'm going to have to face it now, right? No, that's, that's not what he does. He, he, he sends word to the army to say, I need you guys to get Uriah to go out on the front lines in hopes that Uriah would get killed. And that's exactly what happens if you read the story. You see that, that Uriah gets taken out to the front lines of this, this army fighting in battle and that he dies. 
And like, I don't know about you, but as I'm reading this story, I'm like, what in the world is he thinking? Like, David's solution to his problem is having this man killed, and like, he does, and and I just think to myself, like, how do you live with yourself after that? Like, how do you move on from doing something like that? Like, what he did leading up to that was bad enough, but now you've taken it to the extreme of like, I don't have the stomach to, to, to confess what I did to my friend and let him know, like, I slept with your wife and I got her pregnant. So my solution to this is to actually have you killed. And I can just make it look like you died in war, and then I'll never have to have this discussion with you, and things will be great, right? And then the prophet Nathan confronts him, and, and, and Nathan is like, dude, what in the world is wrong with you? And, and so Uriah's dead, and, and David ends up marrying Bathsheba, and she gives birth to a, a child. But it's like, man, I, I think if I were David, every time I looked at my wife, this woman that I married, like, all I would be able to think about is my sin. Like, all I would be able to think about is the fact that I saw this woman on a roof, and I sent my servant to go get her and bring her into me. Then I got her pregnant. And then I had her husband, my best friend, killed because I didn't have the guts to to confess what I did and have a very difficult conversation with him and be honest. Like, I would be so incredibly disgusted with myself. Like, all I would be able to think about every time I looked at her in the face was, man, I, I killed her husband. Then she gave birth to a child. We had a child together, and then the child died. Like, all I would be able to think about is, like, how disgusting am I? Like, I I think if I were in David's shoes, like, I would be so overcome by guilt and shame that I think I would just fall into, like, some deep depression. Like, how do you deal with that kind of guilt? And yet, the most fascinating thing that I found about this story in 2 Samuel is, like, If you keep reading, it just seems like that is just one event in David's life. And then he moves on. And he just continues living his life and doing his kingly duty. And I'm like, man, how does he do that? And and as I'm reading this story with our group, I, I just felt so strongly like God revealing to me and showing to me how many things in my own life that I've still held on to. Like that I haven't released to God. Like I never did anything like David did. But I'm thinking, man, like some of the stuff that, that was coming into my mind was like years ago. Like some of it 10, 15 years ago, mistakes that I made in my past. That, that God was showing me that I hadn't really gotten past that I was still carrying some sense of shame and guilt for what I had done. There was a pastor uh, who I, I, I very much look up to, but he was, he was giving this analogy about our sin, and he, and he brought out a whiteboard. And for those of us that can remember being in, in grade school or high school, we remember teachers used to use whiteboards, right? And they'd write on them, and then they'd get the eraser when they were moving on to the next subject, and they would erase it. But this pastor, he was giving this analogy, and he wrote sin across the whiteboard. And, and many of you may, may, may be able to visualize, I'm hoping, this in your head. But any time you would erase what was written on the whiteboard, like it wasn't completely gone. Like it's interesting. We have one here at the church in the conference room, and we have staff meetings on Tuesdays. And we have a giant whiteboard in the conference room where we have our, our meetings, or did have our meetings before Um, everything that's going on in the world started happening. But when we would meet, we would write different things on the whiteboard and different things. And whenever you would erase it, like you would still be able to see kind of like whatever color marker you used. And so the pastor is giving this analogy and and he's showing, he's saying, man, so much of my life has been spent in this realm of like feeling like that whiteboard. Feeling like I would come and I would confess my sins to God. And yeah, I know like God's, God's forgiving, right? Like I'm a Christian, like, I know that, right? Like, if you were to ask me on on a Christian quiz, like, is God forgiving? Like, I'm going to get that question right, right? Like, of course he's forgiving. He died on the cross for me, and yet he's explaining how most of his life 
was spent living out of this realm of feeling like the whiteboard where it's like, yeah, God kind of got the eraser out and, 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 and erased the word sin on the whiteboard, but you can still kind of see the outline of the word there. And as he's giving this analogy, I'm thinking, man, like I have spent so much of my life feeling exactly like that. Right? Like, that's how I've spent most of my life feeling. Like, again, if someone were to ask me, like, does God forgive? I'm going to get that right. And yet, so much of my life has been, been spent feeling like he doesn't forgive maybe completely. Like, I think for, for many of us that have spent any time in church, there are certain characteristics about God that are easier for us to understand, right? Like, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is Hebrews 12. The end of it, we see this, this picture of God. And, and even more so in Revelation chapter 4, we get a picture of the throne room. And we see like the amazing like holiness of God. And this crazy picture of like fire and thunder and lightning coming from his throne. And like it's easy for me to read something like that and understand like the holiness of God. Right? Like, like I understand that. Like we serve a terrifying God. Like, like the word of God says that, that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Like that's easy for me to understand. Like that God is so big and vast and incredible. Like that's easy for me to understand. But it's a little bit harder for me to understand and wrap my mind around God's mercy. And, and God's forgiveness. Like when it comes to God's like holiness, like I have no problem having no limits on that and understanding that even I don't understand that completely. Like there are no limits and there are no words to express how much and how much holiness our God embodies and yet somehow I put limits to his forgiveness and it doesn't make any sense. Like somehow Throughout my life, there have been moments and, and even seasons that I've walked through where I almost walked around feeling like he only washed me like, like halfway clean. Or like on a good day, a really good day, feeling like he washed me like 99.9% .9 clean. Like walking through life, feeling like that whiteboard, like, yeah, God, you, you forgave me and you washed me, but, but there's still a little bit of residue left. Not because of you, but because I am so disgusting because I am such a, a failure and because of how I have screwed up in life. And so I'm reading that story of David and I'm wondering like, how does he not feel like that? Like I have done some, some pretty bad things in my life, but I never done anything like that. Like I never slept with another man's wife and then had her husband killed to cover up my sin. And so I'm reading that and I'm seeing how David just kind of moves past it. And I'm thinking, what did David understand about God that I don't? Like, what is it about God's character that David understands here that I don't fully understand? Because David isn't walking around after this like he thinks he's only like partially clean. Like he's walking around in freedom. We understand that, that David is referred to a, a, a man after God's own heart. And I'm thinking, what is it that he understood about the nature of God that I don't? And so I began to read. And the passage that we're going to be in today is Psalm 51. So you can turn and open your Bibles with me there. But Psalm 51, starting in, in verse 1. This is a chapter on, on David's confession of his sin. And I began reading this. And, and he starts in verse 1 and he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. So what is David saying here? He's saying, God, I screwed up. But God, please, would you, God, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Like he's using this terminology of this abundant, this, this never-ending love that you have for me, God. See, he's, 
What he's done is he's taken his eyes off of himself and he's, and he's turned them on God and he said, God, would you forgive me not because I am so good or not even because I feel so bad about this, but God, would you forgive me because you are so loving? Like, because you are so merciful, God, would you forgive me? And he continues, he, he says, wash me thoroughly, verse 2, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And jumping down to verse 7, he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Like, that whiteboard analogy that, 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 that I saw from the other pastor do and that I explained to you, like that whiteboard analogy, like that whiteboard is not whiter than snow. Like there's still a little bit of the, the marker residue left on it. And yet David is saying, God, would you wash me whiter than snow? God, like you are the creator of the universe. Like you have the ability according to your love and your mercy to wash me whiter than snow. Like I cannot do that for myself. Like, if it's up to me, like, I am going to be walking around in this shame and guilt. So David, in this moment, he has taken his eyes off of himself. And this is the part that I think you and I are missing, church. This is the reason why you and I get held captive by guilt and shame for things that maybe you did 10, 15 years ago that you haven't seemed to be able to move past. Because I, what I think happens is I think when we approach God and ask for forgiveness, we almost do it based on our own goodness. We say, God, would you forgive me because you know I've really been trying and I've really been, been doing pretty well and I just screwed up with this one thing. And yet we don't see David doing any of that. No, he's coming to God and he's not saying, God, would you forgive me because I'm so good or because I haven't messed up that bad. No, he's coming to God and he's saying, God, would you forgive me because you're so loving? And I started thinking about in 1 John, and, and I started thinking about like, what is it that I don't understand about 1 John? 1 John 1, 9, it says, if you confess your sins, he, again, understand, taking our eyes off of ourselves and looking at him, it says that, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of 99.9% .9 of all unrighteousness. No, that's not what it says. It says of all unrighteousness. And as I'm reading that and studying the, the, the life of David, I'm thinking, what is it that I don't understand about this? I mean, what am I thinking? Like, am I doubting the word of God? Like, am I doubting the power of God? and his abundant mercy, and his abundant love for me? And if I'm being honest, that's exactly, I think, where we find ourselves. But those are lies and doubts that we have in God's word that come from the enemy. Where he asks us this question that we see him ask from the beginning of time with Adam and Eve. He says, did God really say that? Like, like, God doesn't mean all your sin. Like, he's going to wash you. Like, he doesn't mean, like, whiter than snow. Like, you're still going to have to carry some guilt and shame around. And yet, David understood that that is not reality. He understood that when he came and confessed his sin to God, that God made him whiter than snow. That he removed 100% of it. And I started wondering, as I was, I was reading this, and thinking about this and thinking about my own life, I began to think and, and, and pray for you and think to myself, like, what would our church look like if all of us were operating from that place of knowing that God in his abundant mercy for us and his abundant love for us, not based on our own goodness, that he cleanses us and washes us whiter than snow. Like, what would our church and our life look like if we believed that 100%? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Many of you are, are familiar with this passage, but 
But it says in, in verse 21, it says, For our sake, he, God, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Like, so, so what did I become? What did you become when Jesus Christ willingly hung on the cross for us? It says right there in 2 Corinthians that you and I became the righteousness of God. That God in his holiness looks down on us and he doesn't see the mistakes. He doesn't see the ways that you failed him and the ways that you've screwed up and, and all of those things that you are still holding on to. He sees the righteousness. He sees his righteousness that he poured out over you through the blood of Jesus. And I started thinking, man, what would it look like if we started claiming these things and living out of these, these things? Like living out of these truths and believing them. In Psalm 51, jumping down to verse 12, it says, Restore to me. Again, getting back to the, the confession of David, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sins will return to you. Sinners, excuse me, will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, guiltiness, O oh God, and O oh God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Like, what if you and I started living out of this revelation that, that, that God made so abundantly clear to David? So, so we see here in Psalm 51 what David does. He comes and he confesses his sin to God. He asks God to forgive him. And he believes that God washes him whiter than snow. Like, what would happen if churches, in churches, if we started believing these things about ourselves? I mean, church, aren't we sick of looking around the world and seeing people who have no relationship with God seemingly have more peace than us? Like walking in this sense of freedom and this guilt-free mode that many of us long to be in. And, and it's like we look around the world and we see people who are doing some pretty bad things and it seems like, Man, they're, they're free from the guilt and shame. Like, aren't we sick of looking at that and thinking, man, how is it that they have more freedom than I have? I mean, imagine how much joy you and I would be filled with if we could fully understand and believe this. And know that when you and I humble ourselves and come before this all-creating God, and ask him to forgive us. That he forgives us. That it's not based on your works. It's not based on you being able to earn back his trust. But he looks at you and he says. Son, daughter. I can forgive you because of what I put my son through on your behalf. Like what would our life look like if we walked in this kind of freedom? Like, I, I almost imagine a church where people are just running up and down the aisles, like rejoicing, like skipping, singing at the top of their lungs because they have found such freedom in the grace and the forgiveness of God. Like, what would it look like in your life if when you came to God, you really believed that He was going to forgive you 100%? Because I want you to know, church, that is the God that you and I serve. Like, God does not call you to carry the baggage that you, some of you have been carrying around in life for the last 10 years. Like, God desires for you to be free of that. God wants to have a relationship with you, not based on your own goodness, but based on His. Yes, we pursue holiness. Yes, we turn and walk away from our sin. But we can't do that efficiently and effectively until we believe 
God's word, until we believe that he really is going to forgive us. You see, there is something that happens in me, in this revelation that I've had when I come before God now. I'm like, God, man, I blew it. Like, I screwed up. God, please forgive me. God, I don't want to go back to this. I don't want to carry this thing around anymore. And when I believe that he forgives me, I can walk away rejoicing like we see David doing. Where he says that, God, would you restore, restore the joy to my heart. And God does. Why? Not because you're carrying around the shame still. But because that you believe. Because you believe that God forgives you 100%. Church, this, this is the God that we serve. A God God that is so abundant in mercy and love that there is nothing, hear me, there is nothing that you have done that is too big for God to absorb. Our decisions in life and our mistakes in life, they deserve a punishment. They deserve a consequence. But what I believe God wants you to understand today is that he paid the price for you. Like he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into a broken world to hang on a cross for you, to die the death for you, to to, to take the punishment that you and I so desperately deserved. Like he looks at you And he sees his son. And I think to myself, like, man, if if, if I were God, like, I would never understand, like, I'm not that arrogant. Like, I'm not God, okay? But, But I try to think and put myself in that realm as a father. And I, and I have two boys, and I think to myself, man, if I were God and I sent one of my sons to the cross to die for humanity, to pay the price... Like, I would want to look down on a people knowing that my son died in their place and to see joy and freedom in their lives. Like, that is what would make me happiest as a father, to know that I sacrificed my son for you. And that you were walking around in freedom and that you were just so thankful and incredibly full of joy and peace because of that gift, that free gift that was offered to us. And yet most of us walk around in shame. And as I think about that and pray about that, I wonder how many times is God just looking down with a broken heart because he's thinking, child, don't you get it? Like, I don't see it. Like, my son paid for that. You don't have to carry that anymore. That's the whole point of Jesus. Man, I, I, I am praying this week that you are hearing these words, that we would understand what David understood. And David was before Jesus. Like that was before Jesus even came into the world and yet he had a better understanding of that mercy and forgiveness that God offers more than a lot of us do. Listen, God did not send his son to die on the cross for you so that you could carry around that shame and guilt any longer. God wants you, yes, to confess it, to acknowledge it, To own it. But to own just as as much of his forgiveness. And to know that you can walk away in freedom. Let's pray. God, help us today. God, help us to understand 
the amazing love and forgiveness that you have for each and every one of us. God, help us to understand that there is nothing that we could do to earn it. God, that, that, that when we come to you, God, when we own our mistakes, when we own our sin, when we own our shortcomings, God, I pray that you would bring us into a realm like David of repentance, of coming before the creator of the universe and owning what we did, owning our mistakes. But God, that when we do that, that we would understand what David understood, that you are so rich in mercy. God, that you wash us whiter than snow. God, that we don't have to walk around pretending to be something that we're not. God, that we can own our shortcomings and then come before an all-loving, all-forgiving God and walk away rejoicing. Because you paid the price for us through your son. God, I pray for anyone, God, anyone who is out there who may have been carrying around this guilt and shame, maybe some for years and years and years. God, I pray that you would bring them to a place to know that they are forgiven. God, that you paid the price so that they don't have to walk around in shame. God, bring us to that place. Bring us into that revelation. You did not send your son to die for us so that we could carry this baggage anymore. God, and I am praying right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would let go of it. And that we would walk away today in freedom. We love you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Show me.